you ever been watching a movie and you heard a suppressed gunshot and it was super unrealistic, so you complain to your SO or your friend about it, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Guys, comment with the movie or TV show or video game with the worst suppressed sounds of gunshots. <laughs> comment section will get me banned at some point, but that day is not today. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest support of the channel right now is Brownells. Brownells is the hero that we deserve, but not the one that we need. They are bringing ancient guns back from the grave to haunt us, and we can't thank them enough for it. Go ahead and give Brownells a shout out. A big thank you to them, and of course, a big thank you to our other sponsors. No Name Armory, typically has ammunition. The Sonoran Desert Institute to learn that gun trade, gunsmithing craft, and of course, Hack Industries with their stabilizing braces. Go check them out. Ladies, gentlemen, am I often forgotten? Most certainly not by me. Browning High Powers, welcome to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. How a suppressor could save your life. Kevin Owens, very famously in my fighting rifle video, talked about how he was on a rooftop uh, about to engage some insurgents when, as he fired his rifle, a short-barreled Mark 18, much like the one that we have right here, he did not have a suppressor on. It was at night, and the fireball from his Mark 18 immediately alerted nearby enemy who began to engage him with accurate and heavy suppressive fire. Now, Kevin Owens walked away from that day because he is a goddamn animal. But the point being is that a suppressor in that case could have made it much harder for an enemy to detect him, just like it could be important for us in the various types of situations he might find yourself in. So we're gonna assume for a moment that things are bad. Fallout New Vegas type bad and that we need a suppressor for a fighting rifle. So we're gonna be talking about the different types of suppressors that we need for that fighting rifle and how those can protect you and save your life. So let's get into it without further ado. A quick note should be made that if you are looking for a suppressor for not a fighting rifle, for like a precision rifle or for a pistol, that your considerations will be slightly different because uh, different suppressors are for different types of uses. But we're talking about fighting suppressors or fighting rifles, so let's go ahead and let's get into it. Now, if you're looking for a history of suppressors and why they're so heavily regulated, I would highly recommend T-Rex Arms and his brother Isaac with a great video on how we were screwed out of having easy to get suppressors and uh, they did a great job on it. So go ahead and check that out. But today we're gonna be talking about what we're good at, the practical and tactical uses and applications of suppressors. So a lot of people, when they are trying to find a suppressor, like this one right here, we have a Surefire RC2, sorry, RC. They get lost in the sauce. They're not sure what to look at, what's important, and what doesn't matter. So today we're gonna to try to clear that up a little bit and talk about how these different categories within a suppressor will save your life. To start off with, one of the most important things you should be looking at when you're looking for a suppressor, a silencer, a can, FYI, no one gives a fuck what you call it, is sound suppression. If your suppressor can't suppress sound, then you don't have a sound suppressor. So you should have a can that does a relatively good job. Now understand, on a 5.56 gun, uh, or even a 300 blackout gun that's shooting supers, uh, you still need to wear hearing protection while you're firing with a suppressor because they don't bring it to a level that is safe to listen to without hearing protection on. But the whole point of that sound suppression is to make it difficult to locate where your shots are coming from specifically and to make it more pleasant for you when you're shooting. So to illustrate that point, we have a couple different ODA guys, different Raiders who have been into various engagements and they've been in situations firing from a mountaintop, from a hillside onto uh, various uh, people that they were engaging. And when they were firing with a suppressor mounted to their weapon, it was very difficult for those individuals to ascertain where they were firing from because a sound suppressor by attenuating and uh, reducing the decibel level and also kind of changing the tone which changes how the sound is traveling through the air made it difficult for them to precisely locate where their shots are coming from so if you're engaging somebody having that suppressor on will make it more difficult to ascertain precisely where your shots are coming to from simply due to the sound attenuation now a lot of people, when they start getting into suppressors, they go crazy chasing the decibels. How low can they go? But I'm here to tell you that you shouldn't be chasing decibels because many of the tests that you see, I don't believe are scientifically valid. Testing things in your backyard at peak decibel level 
really doesn't matter. There's a whole lot that goes into sound. If you've studied the human ear, you know that there's a lot more than just peak decibel level um, as far as what your ear is actually perceiving and how that sound is actually traveling. There's tone, frequency, and a whole lot of different things. So if we're talking about a good way to measure sound on a suppressor, I would highly recommend that you check out Pew Science. He has a great website where he has a controlled environment and he's specifically looking at the entire waveform and then with a mathematical model um, is able to emulate what the human ear is perceiving uh, as it travels through the air, depending on air density and that type of stuff. Um, he's, the en he's an engineer, he knows what he's doing and I'd highly recommend you take a look at that as opposed to looking at pure decibel levels because they don't tell the entire story. Certain suppressors have very pleasant tones such as the Surefire RC2 in his testing, he showed that the deeper tone uh, is, is better and easier to listen to and is makes it more difficult to place and is just easier at, on you as a shooter versus a tone of certain other suppressors, which is not as good. So there's a lot more than peak decibel level. So don't go chasing decibels. Go to Pew Science and go check that out as far as the sound levels that are concerned. Another thing to look at is going to be flash suppression. Just like we talked about with Kevin Owens, when your weapon fires, there's gonna be unburnt powder. That unburnt powder is gonna come out, ignite, you're gonna have that nice little fireball coming out along with other things such as back pressure and hot gases and all that kind of stuff. And that causes that visible fireball that could possibly give you away and get you killed. So you wanna make sure that you have a suppressor that can reduce the amount of fireball and flash that is seen at night, especially if you have some type of thing going on at night. You don't wanna give yourself away by firing and putting out a huge fireball. So. Suppressors do a really good job of reducing that fireball. Now, suppressor designs come a whole long way. Um, in addition to the baffle design, along with the end cap design, can drastically reduce that fireball that you see. With military type suppressors like the Surefire, the CAC, the Dead Air right here, they're made specifically with signature reduction in mind, which is they paid a lot of attention to the type of fireball that was coming out of these suppressors. Because no matter what, you're still gonna get a little jet of flame coming out of there, especially as these guns heat up, because you're still trying to control an explosion with those baffles inside the suppressor. So when you're looking at a suppressor, ensure that your suppressor does a fairly good job. And also a thing to think about is going to be your barrel length. The shorter the barrel you go with, the more problems you could possibly run into. Because the shorter the barrel, the more unburnt powder that you're gonna have, and then you're going to have more blasts. If you've ever fired a, you know, a 10 inch or a 10 three inch AR with a break on there, or even a flash rider, you still get that big muzzle flash coming out of there. So understand that if you're gonna be running a 10 three uh, AR, make sure that you have a suppressor that is rated to be able to handle uh, that barrel length, because not every suppressor is going to be. In the case of CAC and Surefire, which is what I typically recommend for a fighting kind of suppressor, they do a pretty good job of handling that fireball. But a note must be made at this point that the longer you go on your barrel, the less fireball you're gonna get. So going up to a you know, 14 and a half, a 16 and a half inch barrel, such as what we have on this URGI right here, um, you're gonna have much less flash compared to the Mark 18. And then of course, put a suppressor on there and you're gonna have even less. So again, this also comes down to a conversation of what are you comfortable with, right? Because a short barreled AR, of course, is really nice. It's very easy to maneuver with this guy. Uh, it's easy to get in and out of doors, but depending on your environment, if you're gonna be out in the woods or something like that, you know, there is a lot of merit to be using a longer rifle because not only do you get less flash and bang coming out of there, so it can make it harder for people to uh, tell where you are, but you also get increased muzzle velocity on your slugs. So compared to the Mark 18, 10 3 barrel, typically you're getting around 26, 2700 feet per second, which sounds like a lot. But the 5.56 cartridge needs a lot of speed to do good and deadly things. Compare that to like a 20 inch AR, like your typical M16A2s, A1s, all that kind of stuff. You're getting close to 32, 33,000 feet per second, which is absolutely devastating. Uh, at most ranges that you typically associate with the M16 well up to 500. So understand that the longer the barrel you're going with, the more effective you're gonna be. However, I understand it's gonna be more difficult to navigate with. So again, concessions must be made and you must figure out what is acceptable for you and what is going to work for you. But in general, I say if you can run a 14.5, 
run a 14.5. And beyond all that muzzle flash and all that hiding right there, another thing to think about is IR glow. As you fire these suppressors, as they heat up, depending on the types of materials used, they may begin to emit light in the near IR or IR spectrum. So you won't be able to see it with your naked eye, but you'll be able to see it with your night vision or other people trying to find you and kill you could see it through their night vision. So I have a couple older suppressors made with different types of older materials. And some companies even nowadays make them with materials that are older. And after about 15 rounds, that suppressor will be glowing like a lightsaber, which is cool for videos. But it won't be so cool if you're on the side of a mountain and there's no artificial light anywhere nearby and somebody sees your little lightsaber on your suppressor because you've been engaging them uh, and they're able to put effective fire onto you because your suppressor gave you away. So in that case, that material could get you killed. So make sure that you have a suppressor that keeps that amount of uh, visible and our light to a minimum if at all possible. Now understand that if you're mag dumping magazine after magazine after magazine through a suppressor, it's going to heat up and it's going to be get begin to get visible. That's just the way it works. It's trying to contain explosions. It's going to heat up. It'll eventually start glowing red even to the visible eye. But try to get one that mitigates it as much as possible. Again, your good military cans are typically going to do that. So something to look at, something to research to ensure that you don't get killed. Because again, you might want to be believe that nobody else is going to have night vision but you. But it's best not to underestimate your enemies. Something to think about. Another way that a suppressor is going to help you from uh, not getting killed and could possibly save your life is under night vision. When you're shooting under night vision, um, you have a lot of things to contend with. And the last thing that you want to contend with is have to contend with the flashes from your muzzle. So that comes into having a good flash hider as well as a good suppressor. So if we, with a good suppressor, we're going to severely limit the amount of flash we're going to be seeing under night vision. Now, of course, modern night vision is auto-gated and does a really good job of dealing with bright lights, but if we can at all mitigate it with a good suppressor and have less light source coming from us, especially as we're trying to track a moving target and moving through a dynamic environment, the better it's going to be. Because imagine that you're trying to shoot somebody, and again, we're not in, you know, shooting a cardboard, they're moving through buildings, they're moving car to car, and every time I'm firing, I'm getting that nice little flash that's kind of disorienting and making it difficult to track precisely where that guy is versus with a suppressor is going to severely limit that. So again, a suppressor is a really good idea, especially if you're shooting our night vision. Again, if we can put every advantage towards us, why not do that? So again, another way a suppressor is going to possibly save your life, and not get you killed. Finally, a good thing to look at is going to be your muzzle device itself. You want to have and pick a suppressor that uses a good mount that is usable without the suppressor. So in the case of the Surefire, we have a four prong right here, but a three prong performs in much the same way. The three and four prong suppressors from Surefire do a really, really good job at reducing and almost eliminating all muzzle flash in a lot of situations. Now, in the dead of night, in a dry environment, you're still gonna get muzzle flash, but they do pretty dang good, and also they don't create a whole lot of concussion, and they're just good muzzle devices on their own. So if your suppressor requires you to have a uh, massive break, and if you have the suppressor off, it's just throwing huge fireballs off. I can think of a couple suppressors that do like the Q Cherry Bomb. They have a different um, a muzzle device now beyond that, but like, I think it's kind of useless. If you can only fire with your suppressor on, there are situations where you might not want to have the suppressor on there for a variety of uh, different tactical considerations. So ensure that the muzzle device and the mounting system itself is usable and makes sense without the suppressor. And what goes beyond that is make sure that with that mounting solution that you have on your, for your suppressor, that it's good. Um, not every suppressor mount is built uh, the same. Uh, every design has its own little flaws and own little weaknesses. Um, you know, mounts will become carbon locked. So what's going to happen is when you have that suppressor on, as those hot gases are flowing back, they're going to flow back over the mount and they could possibly lock both the muzzle device and the suppressor to each other like cement with that carbon as it is dried and it just cements those two pieces together. So different suppressors use different means of removing stuck suppressors. So when it comes to the Surefire, if that becomes stuck, all you have to do is rotate the collar like this, 
and then fire a live round through and it will shoot the suppressor off. That's true for a lot of military type suppressors because they assume that at some point it'll probably get carbon locked on. It happens to me a little bit because being out in the Pacific Northwest, I'm shooting at night, it's cold. On top of that, it's typically raining. Water combined with heat, uh, expanding metals, contracting metals, all that type of stuff. I typically get a lot of carbon lock because of that despite whatever suppressor mount I use. So I always ensure that I have a good suppressor mount that makes it easy to remove uh, if necessary, whether it be a live round or what have you. So make sure you find a good one. There are, of course, some really innovative things out there, like the Q-Can has a really cool taper mount that almost eliminates your carbon lock completely, and they do a really good job of that. So again, look at your different mounts, figure out what's gonna work for you, and find a good mount that works both as a muzzle device and as your, uh, as your suppressor host. Consider POI shift. Whenever I throw a heavy piece of metal at the end of my barrel, I'm going to change my point of impact. So when I zero my gun, my red dot, my reticle is at a certain point. It's right in the middle of that bullseye I fire without a suppressor, dead eye, right? Right in the middle, good to go. However, I mount that suppressor, I add weight, Maybe I get a shift down, maybe to the left, right, up. It's pretty typical suppressor. So if you're going to be buying a suppressor, something to consider is going to be, what is my point of impact shift with my suppressor mounted? This is something that you should be testing. Uh, many of the military suppressors, like Surefire, Knights, Dead Air, all those kind of guys, um, are reported to have no to very minimal shift. The um, Surefire, I believe, guarantees under a MOA on its shift, which is pretty good, and I find that to be Pretty true, I'm typically about 0.5 on my shift when it comes to, um, depending on the rifle and the barrel profile and that type of stuff. But if there is a shift, make sure you know what, what that is. And if you zero your rifle with the suppressor on there, see how that changes in different environments and that type of thing. Make sure that you're being as proficient and as thorough with your equipment as necessary. There are too many suppressors to talk about that all have their own little quirks, but you should know them and understand them if you're gonna be using them to possibly defend your life. The fact of the matter is, is that although these don't weigh a whole lot, they are at the end of your gun. Being at the end of your gun with science and physics and all that shit, you tend to feel the weight a lot more than you would if you're just holding it in your hand. So you might hold a suppressor and say, well, that isn't that bad. We'll mount that at the end of a 16 inch barrel or a 10 barrel and you're like, oh, that actually does feel quite a bit heavier than I thought it would be. Because of the fact of the matter is, if I have a suppressor with more baffles, with more length on it, with more weight on it, with more material, it's gonna be more effective. It's gonna be bomb proof. It's gonna have tons of baffles to contain that blast. It's gonna do a great job of flash suppression because it's bigger, but that's more weight. So unless you're just a giant of a man and weight is not a consideration at all, you're gonna to have to find something that is a good balance. So again, look at that size of your suppressor and look at that weight and figure out what is going to work for the type of rifle that you're using that is acceptable uh, because otherwise, if you have a suppressor that's so big that it works great, but you never put it on your rifle because you're like, shit, this thing's heavy. It's not that good of a suppressor then. So make sure you find that good balance. Back pressure. <laughs> Here we go, right? So when you add a suppressor onto a barrel, what you're essentially doing is prolonging the time that the system is under pressure from those expanding gases at the gas port or dwell time. This is good and bad. It's good because with increased pressure, we see um, more force exerting on the action. That means that there's a pretty good chance that that action is then gonna open up and be reliable. However, this is also bad as that increased back pressure also imparts more parts wear upon your rifle. So the extractor has to work harder, the bolt carrier has to work harder, all the springs have to work harder because everything is moving faster and is under a lot more heat. And on top of that, a suppressor makes a gun much much dirtier, especially when it comes to your AR-15 type rifles that are DI. So understand when you're selecting your suppressor to look at one that has as low of a back pressure as possible while still preserving the other qualities that we talked about. So there are certain cans like the OSS which have a low, low back pressure. However, their flash suppression qualities aren't all that great. So again, you have to kind of figure out that balance for yourself and figure out what is going to work. But Suffice to say, if you have a suppressor mounted, um, you might be surprised at how dirty your entire gun gets from all that back pressure and that comes into maintenance. With the suppressor added, understand that you're gonna be maintaining your rifle a little bit more because it's gonna get a lot dirtier. But again, I think that the 
the drawbacks that you get from that increased back pressure and parts wear and dirtiness from the gun is absolutely worth the benefits gained from making yourself more difficult to pinpoint and making yourself more invisible as you're engaging certain combatants. So again, it's all about balance, finding that thing that's going to work for you. So what it all comes down to is a suppressor is a force multiplier when it comes to being on your rifle. It both quiets a weapon, makes it easier to shoot, makes it harder for, to be detected. And of course, the weapon does get dirtier. It does wear the gun out a little bit faster, but it is a net gain when it comes to having a suppressor in your weapon. It is unfortunate that it's very difficult to get them, that there's such long wait times. Those can be lessened if you build your own with a Form 1, which is completely legal to do. Buy a build kit, literally tube, screw in some baffles, and you have yourself a suppressor. Um, the problem, of course, is build quality between kits can be a little bit wonky at times, so find a good build kit, but definitely get a suppressor. Do your research, find the one that is going to work for you, and get yourself a suppressor. It will possibly save your life in certain situations, so make sure you do that. But as always, what really matters is training. If you have the sick rifle with a suppressor and all that stuff, but you have no idea how to shoot it or how to move, shoot, and communicate, or how to go between various barricades and obstacles and land navigate, and you're still gonna die. You're still just gonna get out there and get clapped immediately. So make sure that you're using these skills, that you're getting training, that you are expanding your mind in every way possible, and that you are making yourself the weapon. These are cool, but if it comes down to it, you should be able to pick up any weapon and use it effectively. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. If you're looking for training, Cogworks, Bear Solutions, Hideo Strategic, tons of different guys out there, go check them out. <laughs> As always, guys, I've got nothing else for you. Thank you for watching. Final thing for you guys, family. Family is important. Make sure that you're taking time and that you're spending time with them because it really matters. You have to think about what's the most important thing here. And for some of you, you might not have a family in a traditional sense. Your family might be your friends or they might be your coworkers. Whatever they might be, make sure that you invest time into them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate everything you guys do for me. And a final shout out to my Patreon people. You guys have made this channel incredible. And I can't thank you guys enough. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got nothing else for you. Take care.